My name is Colin, and I am a human. I live in the United States, and over here we live in a society that has very clear regulations and social expectations. Social constructs are necessary if we want to be able to form a community, one where we can trust one another and have some sort of regulation. What those should exactly be, though, isn't exactly agreed upon. Virtue ethics is a theory that focuses on the development of a virtuous character, and from that, Stoicism is born. However, what exactly does it mean to be a Stoic, and what does it mean to be virtuous? The term Stoic has changed a lot since its original definition in the 3rd century BCE. To you, it probably means someone who can endure pain or hardship without showing their feelings or complaining about it but back then it had a lot more depth to it. I had the privilege of doing an entire week for a school project living like a Stoic. Every day we'd have three different journal entries and we would basically have to meditate and think about those in terms of how it played out in our own lives. Stoic logic is a very broad scope of study and it's tied closely with what wisdom is. It isn't just having knowledge or information, it's understanding something to the point that no argument could go against it. In other words, your knowledge has to be irrefutable. That is the basis of where you start philosophy. Stoic ethics is about how to live your life, and that, to me, is the main point of even doing philosophy. It's where the four pillars come from, that being temperance or self-control, courage, justice, and wisdom. And from that, you can start to understand everything else in the world. And there's no inherent good or bad associated to any of those, or anything in general. Everything that's good or bad only comes from your perception of it being good or bad. So with all of that background information out of the way, now we can jump to our first topic, happiness. Cicero, the first philosopher who I'll be quoting, is the one who basically helped create what the four pillars even are. He made up the concept of summum bonum, which is basically the highest good, the thing that you should concentrate on the most if you want to get the most out of your flourishment as a human being. Cicero says, The wise person does nothing that he could regret, nothing against his will, and does everything honorably, consistently, seriously, and rightly. He anticipates nothing, as if it is bound to happen, but is shocked by nothing when it does happen, and refers everything to his own judgment, and stands by his own decisions. I can conceive of nothing which is happier than this. So going back to what I said before, things are not inherently good or bad, it's your perception. So if something seems bad, it's only because you're choosing to view it that way. And so if you can get rid of that sort of mindset, then you can get rid of things that seem negative or seem like they're holding you down. A stoic that I recently learned about in the modern era, Ryan Holiday, taught me that obstacles are not things to get in your way. They're not meant to stop you. They can be your footholds as you're climbing up that mountain. They can be your fuel that help fire you to go further and go beyond. Stoics also anticipate that anything can happen. Whether it's expected or not, a Stoic shouldn't genuinely be surprised by anything. And according to Cicero, nothing could be more blissful, could be happier than having the confidence to stand behind any sort of decision or interpretation about anything. So with that, now I have to wonder, what does it actually mean to be happy? Well, first, I think it's beneficial to think about what do I value? And I value ambition. I want to be the best music player that I can. I want to do as well as I can in playing video games. I want to learn as much information as I can and not just get good grades, but actually retain it and use it in my life. I value getting better. I want to treat people around me as good as I can. The people that are close to me, my friends, my family. I want to love them with the full capacity that I'm capable of. And so focusing on that, I think, will lead to my own happiness. 
Stoics try and disregard their own personal feelings. They don't try and focus on selfish desires, and they don't harbor feelings of resentment. They understand that happiness will come in due time as long as you practice your life accordingly. The next quote from Marcus Aurelius, who is one of the most important, if not the most important, Stoic philosopher, laid a lot of groundwork for what philosophy even is to a Stoic. He sort of defined what virtue is, and alternatively what vices are, and he laid the foundations for what Stoicism can even be. He also created a lot of meditations for himself that people all over the world for centuries now have used and utilized in order to study what Stoicism should be in its purest form. Will there come a day, my soul, when you are good and simple and unified? Someday, will you have a taste of a loving and affectionate disposition? Someday, will you be satisfied and want for nothing, or will you be contented instead with your present circumstances and delighted with everything around you and convince yourself that all you have comes from the gods and that all that is pleasing for them is well for you? Will there come a day when you are so much a member of the community of gods and humans as neither to bring any complaint against them nor to incur their indignation? Marcus is asking himself if he'll be satisfied eventually. And in effect, I feel like he's asking if the reader will be satisfied eventually if they do what they're supposed to do. And I hope so. I hope that one day I'll be able to sit back and think, this is perfect. I have no regrets, and everything feels like it's the way it's supposed to be. And when I think of that future, I don't think of being surrounded by material objects or bags of money or something. I imagine there being love, care. I imagine being surrounded by the people that I'm personally closest to. And I feel that that future that I imagine is what any god or gods, if they exist, would intend for me as well. So for the present day me, all that there is is looking forward to that and working towards that. Stoics, however, take that to an extreme, to say the least. Seneca, a philosopher known for sort of reworking how to think about Stoicism, says that you should live it on a day-to-day -day basis, and his writings are still very influential to this day. He thinks that any day could be your last, and so you should treat every day as if it could be your last. You should get the most fulfillment out of every single day possible. Take an extra minute to talk to your grandmother, and when you're tucking your child in the bed, do it with extra care every single time. It could be the last time you ever tuck them in a bed again. If you happen to wake up the next day, that's just a bonus, and you get to redo that cycle over again. I think that it's a little bit of an extreme, though. I think you should balance the future and the present, and I think that what virtue is backs up that idea. Tuesday's topic is virtue, and at its most basic element, it means balance. If you're being virtuous in a trade, that means that you're flourishing at an optimal level, and the opposite of that would be either having too little of that trait or too much of that trait. A vice is when you're demonstrating that, and it's somehow diminishing your flourishment. So for example, if you're too caring, then you're giving too much of yourself away and you're not concentrating on yourself enough. And you can go on the alternative and you can not care enough about other people and not foster your relationships with them. The optimal care when you would be practicing virtue would be practicing that level of self-care and care for others. If you can find anything in human life better than justice, truthfulness, self-control, or courage, turn to it with all your heart and enjoy the supreme good that you have found. But if you find all other things to be trivial and valueless in comparison to virtue, give no room to anything else, since once you turn towards that and divert from your proper path, you will no longer be able, without inner conflict, to give the highest honor to what is properly good. It is not right to set up as a rival to the rationale and social good anything alien to its nature, such as the praise of the many, or positions of power, wealth, or enjoyment of pleasures. Marcus Aurelius. Marcus isn't saying that you have to practice virtue. 
He's just saying that people that do practice virtue usually end up finding it to be fulfilling. Other people that concentrate on stuff like pleasure, usually it doesn't satisfy them. So if you do find something that's more satisfying, then go for that. It's okay to go for that. But if you don't, then practice being virtuous. Stoic indifferences are things that, separate from humans, just exist. They don't have inherent positive or negative qualities, although they can, like money and health, but without applying virtue, they're kind of meaningless on their own. Those stoic indifferences alone won't lead to a happy life, and making that distinction will help with trying to figure out whether or not your happiness depends on you or those different things. And with the inevitability of loss in life, it'll help you maintain that happiness. And whether or not you end up being rich or poor, you can still lead a happy life. Okay. In terms of the four pillars, I feel pretty confident in my day-to-day -day life for three out of four of them. When it comes to wisdom, I am satisfied with the level of information gathering and applying it to my life right now. I still practice healthy skepticism though. In terms of courage, I feel that I can communicate whatever I need to, or if I ever have any concerns, I'm able to voice that concern. When it comes to justice, I feel that I'm able to actively stop wrongdoing, or at least intervene in wrongdoing if I feel that it's taking place. And I feel that with courage and justice, I'm never overconfident or too cocky. I feel that I'm at a good level of practicing it. But for me personally, temperance or self-control is the hardest one for me to deal with, which I'll talk about a little bit later. According to Aristotle, a diminishment of eudaimonia or selfish, not selfish, sorry, pleasant demons is not being virtuous in terms of temperance. And by pleasant demons, he is referring to usually temptations or stuff that gives you pleasure in the moment. And it's probably the hardest for a lot of people to actually practice because in terms of getting the reward, it comes right away for you to feel good. It usually is avoiding falling into that vice or that improper balance that people usually give into because it isn't explicitly stated as bad. When it comes to justice, you're able to see someone that is maybe getting robbed and it's really easy for us as a community to identify that that's bad, but there's no really perfect regulation for what is bad when it comes to pleasure or not. I mean, drinking alcohol is heavily encouraged, especially in capitalism, and it's a huge you know, self-control thing. Apart from the good feelings, it doesn't actually help your flourishment in life. However, Seneca comments that the mind must be given relaxation. It will rise improved and sharper after a good break. And I think that the point of practicing virtue is to prepare for the future. Everything you do now might not have its rewards show right away, but with due time, it will eventually show up. I think that it isn't about achieving perfection right away, but it's about trying to give it your best and doing your best, and those don't yield results right away. And I think that the evening quote really encapsulates what I mean by this. From what did we gain an understanding of virtue? From someone's orderly character, his sense of what is appropriate and consistency the harmony between all his actions, and his greatness of spirit and coping with everything. In this way, we came to understand the happy life that flows on smoothly and is completely under its own control. Again, there's that message about maintaining control through virtue, and in effect, trying to achieve a happy life. And one of the most important places, I think, for a lot of people to try and practice virtue is when it comes to relationships. Say to yourself first thing in the morning, I shall meet with people who are meddling, ungrateful, violent, treacherous, envious, and unsociable. They are subject to these faults because of their ignorance of what is good and bad. But I have recognized 
that the nature of the good and seeing that it is the right, and the nature of the bad and seeing that it is the wrong, and the nature of the wrongdoer himself and seeing that he is related to me, not because he has the same blood or seed, but because he shares in the same mind and portion of divinity. So I cannot be harmed by any of them as no one will involve me in what is wrong. Nor can I be angry with my relative or hate him. We were born for cooperation, like feet, like hands, like eyelids, like the rows of upper and lower teeth. So to work against each other is contrary to nature, and resentment and rejection count as working against someone. Marcus Aurelius and many other Stoic philosophers felt that nature and metaphysics had a big part to play in terms of humanity. He felt that everything was interconnected and he would often bend low to pick up grain. He would go and check up on olive trees to make sure they were doing all right. And with everything being interconnected and having a purpose, he felt that human's purpose was to help one another. He recognizes that a lot of people are ignorant of the fact that naturally we are a community, but rather than disregarding them, he mentally prepares himself to be able to handle them properly when they do come about. And he recognizes that it's okay to be ignorant. After all, everyone was ignorant at some point. And so as someone who's now enlightened, it's his duty to go and help others become enlightened as well. Stokes also believed that we shouldn't take for granted interacting with one another. Seneca would often talk about kids just playing on the beach innocently. They would build sandcastles and frolic about, and that alone is just really precious. I try to reach that by talking to the people around me. I tell them about what I've learned, I share my experiences, I help talk about their experiences with them. I don't try and ever force anyone to, but if there's even the slightest interest, then I go ahead and start discussing with them. And not just our own experiences, but also outside perspectives and other people's experiences. And if anyone doesn't ever want to do that, if they don't want to share our experiences, then that's fine. I accept that. I have a cousin who I have a lot of respect for. He has a high aptitude for a multitude of things and he's very intelligent. However, he's also grown pretty conceited and he won't really accept ever being wrong. And to top that off, he also will talk down and look down on others who he feels isn't as good as him. And to me, that's really unfortunate. Sure, he can strive to do what he wants to do, but I personally, wish for him to be the best him that he can be, but it's fine. He doesn't have to want that, and I can't force him to either. The only thing I can truly control is myself, my own thoughts, and so as someone who doesn't wish for those things, I choose not to have a relationship that is that extra amount of care with him. We still get along just fine, we'll talk and we'll participate in activities together and there's no bad blood or anything, but we don't go that extra mile for one another. And not everyone has to want those extra experiences or end up having that humility to admit and face that you can be wrong. But I think that when looking at relationships like this, it just places a greater emphasis on cherishing the relationships that do have that, that go that extra mile. My favorite relationships are ones that are mutual. I care about being ambitious, and I also look for ambition in friends and close relationships. And I want people to hold me to higher standards. Of course, I want them to do so with standards that I actually care about for myself. I'm not interested in people trying to hold me to their own standards, but I still want them to encourage me to do my best. And one of my favorite relationships, one that I have with a friend named Zura, we do just this. Whenever we have growth or we experience something new that helps us, we encourage it, and that's fantastic. Of course, we don't allow each other to be ignorant of other possibilities, but because we talk about any sort of alternative, I'm sure that we have confidence that the decision we end up making is the one that is best for us. Marcus Aurelius says, Whenever you want to cheer yourself up, think of the good qualities of those who live with you. 
such as the energy of one, the decency of another, the generosity of another, and some other quality in someone else, there is nothing so cheering as the images of the virtues displayed in the characters of those who live with you and group together as far as possible. So you should keep them ready at hand. When thinking about the people around me, it's really easy for me to focus on the negative parts. Through anxiety and my childhood, I naturally think like a pessimist. But in order to achieve happiness, I need to go past those first instincts and start thinking about the good points. I need to think about stuff that I'm proud of. I need to think about how to implement those positive things into my life. I think about the good qualities of the people around me and I need to cherish the fact that I've had this fortune of meeting those good people and I need to think about what I can do on my own to make myself worthy of being in relationships with these awesome people. Marcus Aurelius also says that at dawn, when you have trouble getting out of your bed, tell yourself, I have to work as a human being. He believes that you should disregard your eudaimonics and do everything with your utmost passion and ability. He thinks that instead of staying in bed for a couple of extra minutes, you should just get up and go straight to work. I, however, look at it a little bit differently. I have a dog named Finn and he sleeps with me at night, and in the morning, I usually cuddle and show him affection. I think that there are many different possibilities of what could be considered a correct decision for when you first wake up, however, I think that not taking it for granted and showing those couple of extra minutes of love and care for my dog Finn could never be a wrong decision. Memento Mori is the idea that death is inevitable, and of course the Stoics address this. However, they don't look at it as if it's a negative thing, instead they look at it in a positive light. Do this thing in front of you as if it is the last thing you are doing in your life. Marcus Aurelius. What he means by that is that you should still take care of everything and be as passionate as you can no matter what you're doing. And so in regards to that, I think it's fine to spend those extra few minutes with Finn as if it's the last time we'll ever get to see each other. Cicero and other Stoics think that a sense of community comes naturally. Intrinsically, people care about one another, and it's only through negative associations and experiences that people tend to become antisocial. Seneca says, let us embrace in our minds the fact that there are two communities, the one which is great and truly common, including gods and human beings, in which we look neither to this corner or to that, but measure the boundaries of our state by the sun, the other, the one to which we have been assigned by the accident of our birth. So there is a distinction between the two types of communities, one of which is accidental and that is just our family. I mean, the one that we identify as our family. Naturally, we'll tend to grow closer to them just because the frequency that we see them is much higher, but when you start to look at things differently and see everyone as your family, you'll start to realize that anyone can be your family. And because of that, you should start to treat everyone as if you would treat your family like that. And why not? I mean, we all see the same world, we all experience the same earth, and we are all human. What benefits each of us is what is in line with our constitution and nature. My nature is rational and political. As Antoninus, my city and fatherland is Rome, as a human being it is the universe. It is only what benefits these cities which is good for me. Marcus Aurelius. Marcus recognizes that it's not just him observing communities, he's a part of the communities. Anything that happens in the same city as him will affect him. Anything in the same continent will therefore affect him. Anything in the same world will therefore affect him, and so on and so on, until anything happening in the universe will partly affect him as well, because he's a part of the universe. In modern Stoicism, this takes place on the world scale. Anything that's happening with the climate, like global warming, will indirectly affect him eventually too. And with that, any sort of affairs in different countries, or any sort of scandals happening, anything at all will indirectly affect us as we're part of one community. And so, 
as being a part of that one community, we all have an inherent duty and responsibility to address and fix any issues that arise. Our final day of Stoic Week was about emotion, like what we talked about in regards to happiness. It isn't the things themselves that disturb people, but the judgments that they form about them. Death, for instance, is nothing terrible, or else it would have seemed so to Socrates too. No, it is in the judgment that death is terrible that the terror lies. Accordingly, whenever we are impeded, disturbed or distressed, we should never blame anyone else but only ourselves, that is, our judgments. It is an act of a poorly educated person to blame others when things are going badly for him. One who has taken the first step towards being properly educated blames himself, while one who is fully educated blames neither anyone else nor himself. I think that Epictetus describes it in really clear, easy to understand terms. And after the rest of this video about my week, I don't think I need to actually describe or analyze what the quote is saying. Instead, I think it's more important to try and apply it to my real life because out of all of Stoic Week and Stoicism in general, I feel like this is one of the key takeaways that are beneficial for living a better life. So for me, I hold myself to really high standards, and when I don't meet those standards, I become upset. However, I need to keep in mind that my happiness isn't related to the results that I get. It shouldn't be something that's empirically able to be recorded or something. It's satisfaction, self-satisfaction. And even though a Stoic might not say that satisfaction should be something you go for, I feel like in this context, they wouldn't describe it as wrong either. Philosopher Seneca says that I will keep constant watch over myself, and most usefully, I will put each and every day up for review. I think that pride and confidence can be really motivating and useful stimuli. For a lot of people, it allows them to do stuff that's sort of above themselves, and allows them to go further than they would have otherwise. However, I think it's important that you practice virtue, which is my other key takeaway from Stoicism, in making sure that you don't upset that balance so that pride and confidence are only helping you flourish and you're getting the most out of your own life. I feel pretty confident with what I ended up with because my conclusion was one that I feel Seneca, the last philosopher, sort of confirms before I even read the final quote. Seneca states that, reflect on this, the result of wisdom is stability or joy. The wise person's mind is like the superlunary heaven, always peaceful. So you have this reason to want to be wise, if wisdom is always accompanied by joy. This joy has only one source, an awareness of the virtues. A person is not capable of joy unless he is brave, unless he is just, unless he has self-control. And so with that final quote done, that sort of brings me to the end of Stoic Week, the end of my experience with it at least, and uh, I'm pretty satisfied with where I am mentally right now. I don't think I'll completely live like a Stoic just because I think that they take some parts of it to an extreme, like living every single day like it's your last, but I still feel like a lot of important values, like the stuff about obstacles being footholds, are stuff that I've already been implementing and have helped me with my life. I already had a lot of core sort of principles that were very stoic-like, but I think more than anything, now I feel a lot more justified in why I think the way that I do and continuing to live the way that I do. And even though I still have a vice that has been about self-control and sort of valuing myself, I'm still confident with where I want to go and with getting to where that is. And if there's one more takeaway from Stoic Week that I've had, it's that all happiness that I'm meant to attain will come to me eventually. So thank you for watching my experience with Stoic Week. Goodbye.